Good evening. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Emanuel Kretzer, who is a visiting professor at uh, Braunschweig University of Art and tutor at the Institute of Media and Art uh, and Design. He's founder of Materia Materiability, uh, which is an open access platform for cutting edge new material and technologies. Manuel is co-founder of a Responsive Design Studio in Germany, and he was teaching at chair of CAADETH, uh, where he finished his doctoral degree with focus on smart material and adaptive architecture. Uh, join me to welcome Manuel. Thank you. Okay, hi. Uh, sorry for the um, complications. It's great to be here. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of strange yet familiar to be back here. I've never been in this building. I left actually before the building was finished. So it's, it's kind of funny to see all these familiar faces, people whom I worked with, people who used to be my students in a completely new environment. So it's, it's, it's very nice. Um, um, I changed the title of my presentation. Maybe you've realized it. Um, Tomorrowland, which is both a reference to um, the uh, theme park in, in Disney World, uh, California, which was um, opened in 1957, but also also the science fiction movie, which came out 2014 or something, maybe some of you know it, um, but also to a course which I ran um, last year in Braunschweig, where the task for the students was, um, um, it was a very short course, just a 24-hour design studio, where the task was to uh, visualize how they imagined the future to be like. And um, that's also somehow going to be the, the main topic of my presentation. So part one, change. In 1978, the um, science fiction writer Isaac Asimov um, published an essay which was entitled My Own View, within which he stated, um, it is change, continuing change, inevitable change, that is the dominant factor in society today. No sensible decision can be made any longer without taking into account not only the world as it is, but the world as it will be. This in turn means that our statesman, our businessman, our everyman must take on a science fictional way of thinking. And this kind of change, which Asimov already described some 40 years ago, I think becomes ever more obvious today. We live in a time where technology is multiplying around us at an ever-increasing pace and you're at the right institute in order to experience that yourself. Um, and if we are to believe the director of engineering at Google, Ray Kurzweil, who has analyzed the growth rate of various technological systems, um, this development will by 2045 lead um, to a certain state of singularity, a point where progress will be so fast that it exceeds our capability to comprehend it. Basically implying an infinite amount of change happening momentarily. Once this moment has been surpassed, mankind will reach a state of transhumanism, merging with intelligent machines, and through this surmount the biological restraints of its physical and psychological constitution. Interesting, right? Well, a similar kind of growth can also be observed demographically. So since the um, um, uh, 1960s, the world population has more than doubled, growing from 3 to about 7.5 or 7.6 billion people today and according to a UN study from 2014, is expected to rise to roughly somewhere in between 9.6 and 10.6 billion by 2050. And 70% of all those people are going to be living in large megacities. At the same time, the average global life expectancy has in the last 100 years increased from 46 years of age in 1910 to 70 in 2014, and is supposed to exceed 76 by 2050, and that is globally. In, in Germany, we are looking at numbers um, of people getting 90 years and older, and I suppose in Switzerland um, it's probably even more. Um, by mid-century, we will also need 80% more energy than today. We will consume 90% more food. We will have more trash in the ocean than fish. Almost every vehicle on the planet will be autonomous and self-driving, and apparently human-robot or human-computer relationships could have become common. So obviously all these tendencies not only have an impact on ourselves and our behavior as a species, but also on our planet's ecological system, its biodiversity, its climate and atmosphere, an impact actually so severe and irreversible that scientists are proposing to constitute a new ecological epoch, the Anthropocene, the age of humans. A period beginning in the 1950s with atomic bomb testing, throughout which the face of the planet has been largely defined by human activity. 
However, the Anthropocene is not only a time of man-made disruption, it is also, at least more recently, a moment of blinking self-awareness, a moment of awakening in which we are becoming conscious of ourselves as a planetary force. So we're not only driving global warming and ecological destruction, we know that we are. So what to do when everything one does becomes an, an environmental question? Every time we start the engine of our car, every time we pick up a plastic bag in the supermarket, every time we eat a burger at McDonald's, we change the world, and not because of our actions as individuals, um, but due to our collective act as a species. So to answer that would be a, 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 a very bold, I think, but I think there is a possibility which I call adaptation, or as Norbert Wiener put it in 1954, we are the slaves of our technical improvement when we can no more return a New Hampshire farm to the self-contained state in which it was maintained in 1800. We have modified our environment so radically that we must now modify ourselves in order to exist in this new environment. We can no longer live in the old one. Yet unfortunately, what we tend to do much too often when facing unprecedented challenges is I believe doing the exact opposite. Instead of adapting and changing and evolving, we, and trying to understand the cause and the reason of these events, we, we're trying to block their symptoms through a vicious fight for preservation. So we're building walls against rising sea levels, we're building walls to keep those in need away from those who have walls as the encapsulating response to a glo uh, growingly globalized world. But maybe it's time to reconsider our attitude. Maybe it's time to stop fighting change and instead embrace it as an opportunity, as something from which new can emerge. And in that context of transformation, of mutation, paired, I think, with a good portion of naive optimism and curiosity at what the future might behold, try to create spaces and environments and experiences um, that adapt and that include rather than exclude. So on the topic of adaptation, historically in architecture there are three main strategies of achieving spatial flexibility. The first one is spatial abundance, which is also something that you can experience here. Meaning a room is actually so big that it can easily contain a variety of uses, um, like for example the spaces in Baroque palaces which were not predetermined to certain actions or occupations. The second one is some sort of mechanical transformation, which we can witness in one of the earliest examples of 1931 in the Maison de Verre in Paris by Pierre Charot, which contained a variety of flexible and movable, um, mechanically movable elements like sliding or rotating screens or retracting staircases, which were able to transform and to divide the room in order to um, give space for different occupations and different needs. And the third possibility is more of a political statement, which is often based on the active or the creative engagement of the user, um, which is something that Jonah Friedman or Constant Neuwenhus, for example, proclaimed in order to include and empower the individual. But returning to the acceleration in technological progress, I believe that today, almost 50 years after these ideas, we can add one more possibility, um, adaptivity through adaptive materials. Such materials, um, you might have heard about some of them, they can change their shape, they can change their color, they can produce light, they can create electricity, they can store heat or water, they can even adjust their surface texture. So the possibilities are more or less endless. Um, however, despite a growing interest in the dis performative aspect of this kind of materiality, um, most design scenarios are still rather traditional, I think, and fall far from exhibiting any of the radical opportunities that these materials offer. And this has a number of reasons. Um, firstly, of course, many of these materials are still technologically immature and then often not developed in respect to architectural or even design applications. And then even if they are available as finished products, they have not only um, rather narrow properties since they're always designed for a very specific purpose, but also limitations in scale and in durability. Secondly, there is a big gap in between architecture and science, and I think we can all sing a song about this. Um, so the amount of information on new material developments that is communicated in a way that we as architects can comprehend um, without having expert knowledge or insights is very constrained and also often scientifically mystified. 
So d sometimes it almost feels that they don't want us to know what they're doing. And lastly, and this is something that we as designers um, definitely have to address, there is a, a lack in ideologically distinguishing these materials from traditional ones, which means that they're defining dynamic properties are either constrained by forcing them onto existing structures and systems or even neglected by standardizing and categorizing them to make them comparable to non-active materials and then include them in existing databases and catalogs. Um, and I think that's just something we have to be aware of if we want to work with these um, sort of four-dimensional materials. So in an attempt to overcome these, these, these um, issues, as Manja already said, I've initiated um, what I call Materiability um, in 2012, which is an online platform. It's an educational framework and it's an open materials database which provides in-depth access to emerging material developments. The core content is split into three categories and you're very welcome to have a look at the website. There is a, a bunch of projects, a selection of projects, um, constantly growing. Um, experiments that focus on new materials and how they can be used in a creative and innovative way. There is a collection of theoretical scientific essays which provides um, the, the necessary background in order to understand what these materials are, where they come from, how they are being used. Um, and then maybe the most interesting part, there is um, illustrated step-by-step -step tutorials on how you can actually self-make those materials in an informal environment. Um, and the core idea behind this website um, with a focus on experimentation and intuition and also communication is also what I try to follow in my teaching, a philosophy of design by making, understanding design as a dynamic process and not as the result of a predetermined idea, or as Kurt Schwitters has described it in 1924, every form is the frozen instantaneous picture of a process. Does it work? is a stopping place on the road of becoming and not the fixed goal. We acknowledge works which contain a system within themselves, a system which has not been evolved before the work started, but has evolved in the course of it. So in order to mediate this idea, this concept to my students, I run explorative and playful workshops and courses where the students are encouraged to physically experience the functionality of some of these materials um, comprehend the working principles, their composition, and then understand the relationship in between the fabrication procedures and the material's performance. Um, so if they change something in the way they make that material, how does the end result change accordingly? So the results, and I'm going to show some of them, are usually rather speculative installations of which the relation to reality and presence is um, left open to the students. And where the use or functionality or even the idea has evolved throughout the process from what was learned and what was discovered. So to date, still one of my favorite projects that emerged from this idea, and I know that many of you have seen this a hundred times, I'm showing it uh, anyhow, um, is Phototropia, which we did in 2012 here at the Chair for Computer and Architectural Design. Um, it was still in another building. The idea or the, the key topic of this course was autonomy and autonomy not only in the sense that we as designers become independent from um, commercially available or industrially fabricated materials, but also autonomy in order to combine these materials into a self-sufficient system, which would create all the energy that it required by itself. The materials that we used or that we actually made ourselves had in common that they were thin, they were flexible and lightweight, and they could be produced following a set of rather simple instructions. So we made electroactive polymers, which are thin film membranes that can change their, their, their size or their shape in response to a strong electrical field. Um, we made electroluminescent displays, which emit a cold, perfectly homogeneous light across their surface, visible from a great distance. And um, we collaborated with scientists from the EPFL in Lausanne to produce dye-sensitized solar cells, which are a type of solar cell that uses an organic dye in order to convert um, sunlight into electricity. All these components were merged um, or held together by a structural system made of bioplastic struts. And I'm just going to show you the video.
Another project which we also did at the chair for CAD the year after um, is called Resonance. And here the core question really was, what if we had materials that were at least to some extent um, alive? Um, in order to increase the overall complexity of the installation, um, we decided to decrease the material complexity, um, but therefore have more intelligence in the individual components. So we created 40 um, hollow plastic elements, which were able to change their color in response to a change in temperature, and which could both work independently, but also in unison within a larger system. And this is the video. But something more recent, um, that was the stuff that I, that I had done here. Um, there's still some leftovers, which you can see over there. Um, I'm, I'm surprised that the trash one haven't taken it out yet. Um, but something more recent, um, this was a collaboration um, between my class in Braunschweig, where I teach um, mainly first and second um, semester bachelor students in industrial design. And Audi, um, the car manufacturer, um, it's called Concept Brief, and the point of departure here was to, to rethink the notion of the car seat. And imagine that in respect to the future of autonomous driving and an increasing demand for customization and individualization, our cars would become more than mere means of transportation, but instead exhibit aspects of living creatures to become our friends, our companions, basically. So the project started um, with a very intense ideation phase um, on site in Ingolstadt because we wanted to diverge from classical forms and shapes. Um, we strongly looked into patterns and systems and structures that can be found in nature. We then explored how these inspirations could lead to a certain formal language and how they can be described using scripts and algorithms. Um, but we quickly realized that even though we could visualize our geometry, um, it would be very difficult to realize it using conventional technologies. So we teamed up with um, Berlin-based company BigRap, who produce large-scale 3D printers, um, in order to print that seat in one-to-one, -one, um, a process which took roughly 10 days to complete. And in addition to the 3D printed structure, the seat contained um, 38 bespoke components, active components, which you see here, the red ones, um, which are incorporated into the seat surface and which allow the seat to dynamically adjust its, um, its texture, basically, and its, uh, its shape, its haptic properties. And then there are a number of customized uh, cushions from uh, uh, high-performance fabric, which are the black parts here, in order to um, guarantee the necessary comfort and stability. And again, I have a short video about the project.
something a bit more abstract was what I did the year before at the Institute of Advanced Architecture of Catalonia in um, Barcelona. Here the students were asked um, to think about speculative future scenarios um, resulting from some of the global tendencies um, which I described earlier um, and then develop a, a physical intervention which deals with the human body and with the human skin as an extension of our senses and a mediator in between us and the environment and others. Um, and again, in order to transport the ideas, we asked them to make short teaser-like videos. Okay, so after this course, um, I was a little confused. Um, I mean, I enjoyed the aesthetic of the videos and, 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 and uh, the entertainment factor of these stories, but I, I was somehow I was wondering why they all had such dark, such depressing um, visions of the future. And it's not only the Spanish students. I, I think um, similar scenarios are coming from many other architectural schools, the AA, the Bartlett. Um, 
maybe not so much the Netherlands, maybe they've already adopted a more optimistic um, attitude considering that over a quarter of their country has been below sea level for centuries or decades at least. Um, but nevertheless, I decided to approach this idea from a slightly different angle, optimism. And here I would like to read a quote by Timothy Morton, um, which he published shortly after converting his home to wind-generated electricity, which meant that he could produce much more energy and much more power than he ever needed. Um, you think ecologically tuned life means being all efficient and pure? Wrong. It means you can have a disco in every room of your house. So I tried this experiment um, during a studio, a design studio, which I ran at the Dessau International Graduate School of Architecture in the fall of 2016. And again, the start was very similar. Again, the students were asked to, to look at current developments, um, current tendencies, but instead of seeing them as problems that might lead to the apocalyptic extinction of our species, treat them as opportunities, neglecting any sort of romantic associations that we might have, meaning that um, we are sad because the icebergs melt because our grand-grandchildren will never be able to see any of them. Um, in parallel, we experimented with materials that could somehow be associated to the particular scenario, and then we tried to synthesize the material logic, the material behavior, and finally develop design proposals, which were both based on these material phenomena and a response to the initially posed hypothesis. So m the first group um, took on the topic of deforestation. And after an initial phase of understanding the event, its cause, um, its predictive development, and possible effects, we asked them to over-exaggerate it into the absolute extreme, into the absurd, like, but do so in a, in a fairly realistic and non-judgmental way. So the result was this high-resolution image of Amazon um, City, where, we, where they simply replaced all the trees of the forest with buildings. So what then would happen if um, there were no more trees on the planet? What would happen to the soil, to the ground? It would most probably turn into some sort of dry land, which would occasionally, when it rains, transform into mud and slime. So the group began experimenting with a slime-like material called ublek, um, which is a non-Newtonian fluid based on cornstarch um, that is liquid or liquidish in its relaxed state, but solidifies when it's exposed to mechanical pressure. So what now if the solidification of that slime and the forms that it creates could be controlled, if it could grow and adjust according to occupational needs, if it could be soft or solid at the same time, and if it could allow for and encourage new ways of living, working, and playing. So what they came up with essentially was this concept of a dynamic living architecture with which would constantly move and change, um, and throughout its transformation create new spaces and environments. Another group um, focused on the problem of space debris, which is circling around our planet um, and posing a threat not only to satellites and space missions, but also on our planet's atmosphere. Um, so the group developed an idea which was um, um, that this trash, which is largely of metallic origin and partially actually quite um, precious metals, um, could be used as a building material for new colonies, and um, of course it had to be on Mars. The concept was based on physical experiments with magnets and iron filings. Um, so their story then was that they would shoot giant um, magnets into space, which would circle around Earth and through the circling collect all the debris in the orbit, and then use Earth gravity in order to slingshot um, um, the, the material to Mars, where it then could be used as a as a building material using the same magnets um, turned into a structural, a spatial habitat. Some sort of kit-bashed um, biosphere made of recycled um, spacecraft and satellite parts. And the last group which I want to show um, looked into the um, phenomena of depression as a globally advancing disease. Um, they first came up with this Hollywood script of a place which they called um, Psychobia, where the depressed would, like a horde of zombies, um, chase the non-depressed into some sort of isolated happy colonies, colonies in the sky, and so on and so on. Um, eventually, everything would be good, but anyhow. Um, once we learned how to overcome, and these, these things we had in all the projects, but once we learned to overcome these initial 
problems, difficulties, um, and we were able to think more pragmatically. Um, so we asked the question, what if depression was actually the new norm? Um, what would be the architectural requirements, the new architectural requirements, the spatial demands, um, the three-dimensional needs, essentially the, the Neufert catalog of the depressed. So based on Robert Plutchik's theory of emotion, the group developed this matrix um, where they mapped psychological states and feelings onto architectural qualities such as texture, light, um, openings, color, um, scale, etc. And then they took that matrix um, and went through the cycle of a full day in order to understand how our behaviors, how our emotions, our feelings and related spatial desires are connected and how they vary and change um, over time. In parallel as all the other groups, they um, experimented um, with a certain material, in this case the behavior of styrofoam when it's exposed to acetone, which creates these um, cave-like hollow structures. And then the findings from both methods were used to develop a catalog of spaces reali related to different phases of expression. Um, and um, the anti anticipated um, spatial requirements. Um, so activities such as carving, um, or in addition, the idea was then, in depending on um, the current condition of the inhabitants, they could also individually transform um, and adapt the spaces according to their personal preferences. So activities like digging, carving, um, Playing became not only means for self-expressions, but actually tools for spatial transportation or trans transformation in order to arrive at this highly complex, um, constantly growing and evolving ecology of spatial units. Um, and what I found very interesting here is that it's very similar to this idea of constant or, or Jonah Friedman, but it's, it's in, uh, in difference to an, an additive system where people put and add something in order to what they want to have. This would be a subtractive system. So everything they have, they need is already there. They just have to find it, essentially. Um, so even though at times not only the students but us as teachers really struggled with the self-assigned task, and there were moments when I thought, okay, this is the absolute stupidest idea I ever had, um, Departing from what we see and what we're being taught um, and treating some of these devastating issues we're facing with, with humor and with optimism. I think that it was an extremely satisfying and reassuring experience to see how those disturbing developments were turned into scenarios that were not only plausible, um, but actually maybe even desired or needed because of the joys of the vision that were developed. So in the last course that I want to show, I wanted to take that final part um, even a little further and focus on how such scenarios, which exist, I think, at the intersection between the real and the virtual, and between the imaginable and the imaginary, um, can become even more convincing and persuading. Or to put it in the words of Lewis Carroll, imagination is the only weapon in the war against reality. So the course which actually just ended last Thursday, so this is all brand new material, um, was taught at the Institute of Media and Design at the Technical University in Braunschweig, um, and it was called Ribofunk. The idea was here um, that instead of focusing too much on analyzing and understanding the now in order to make predictions on how the future might become, um, we would simply take the ideas and the visions of somebody else as a basis in order to develop our own speculative scenarios. Um, so Ribofunk, maybe some of you know it, is a collection of short stories um, written by the science fiction author Paul Di Filippo in 1996 um, with a focus on synthetic biology and gene manipulation. It's a subgenre of cyberpunk. Um, the task for the students was, um, of course, first to read um, these stories, analyze them, and then pick a certain scene which they found architecturally inspiring and interesting, and then try to visualize its atmosphere in the form of a short video clip. Each of the groups um, choose, of course, very different, not only different stories, but also very different and, and very particular methods and techniques. Um, but without going too much into detail of the um, different stories, I'm just going to show you a few of the results.
So they had initially worked with gallium, which is a metal that melts at room temperature, basically. But then, um, because the huge amount of gallium that they would have needed in order to visualize that scene um, would have been too expensive, so they actually they used wax. They made um, silicon casts. They filled them with wax, um, and then they melted that wax, and then they reversed the um, the time lapse. And the task also was to work with the medium film as a possibility in order to distort our reality, like to show something that in reality wouldn't be possible.
and none of the groups had any experience in 3D animation or even video editing beforehand. So what I learned so far from these experiments is that no matter, I think, how tomorrow or our future might turn out, I think it's important that we maintain our curiosity, that we continue playing and experimenting and, and actually keep questioning, testing and probing, which I believe is essential, especially for us architects, since we are the ones who define the spaces and the environments for the future generations, and we have to design the Anthropocene as we want it to be. That's it. Now we go for a drink. <laughs> no, but we can. Um, uh, yeah. I have some questions, but maybe someone else from the audience wants to ask something. Yeah. So Manuel, I had the pleasure to to study together with you here. So I saw how you work, and I'm of course very excited to see the recent works. You come back now here, you see the big robots. I don't know actually if you have, have seen them yet, but could you tell us a little bit how you imagine the, the fabrication of tomorrow? Huh? Because I think you somehow approach or envision this slightly different to what we see here. Huh? Mm. We are working here with large machines and, uh, and robots, and, but what you are showing is on a, somehow addresses a different kind of materialization. So. Um. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this was this is part of what I do. I also I teach digital crafting, so in, it's in industrial design, so it's not necessarily the same scale as architecture. There are different questions of scale. Scale there means more um, about repeatability, basically. Um, we're not working so much with um, robots, but uh, we did a lot of 3D printing in the in the past, and I think especially 3D printing is a very groundbreaking technology, which is now reaching a level of accuracy and also of, of um, cost where it can really change something. And I think that in industrial design especially, um, and also in the car manufacturing industry, they're, they're really um, picking up on that, um, both in terms of the level of detail that you can achieve, and uh, but also the deliberation, because um, if you have these machines now at home, you can everybody can be a, a maker, a, a fabricator, not only a designer anymore. And I think that's also a big benefit of it. Um, of course, they still have to compete, and especially in industrial design, you have to compete with traditional technologies, and it's much more conservative than architecture, which I didn't think beforehand. Um, so, you, I mean, industrial design comes from industrial processes, so there's, there's no, not the rich history of experimentation that we have in architecture. Um, does that answer your question somehow? Yeah, um, Fascinating that we see um, here tests where you work with these skins or membranes, programmable, f flat, and very. So your architecture seems to be disappearing, huh? mm. and, and, or reduced to a millimeter thick membrane or so. Mm. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about this. How you see there the future? Or, um, well, the <laughs> I mean, what it, what I did in the past more was really more on this hypothetical, on, the, on this theoretical concept on how the future might and what our role as architects might be. Of course, that's a very um, a broad thing because our role as architects is very broad anyhow. Um, in terms of building materials, uh, especially in relation to these new functional adaptive materials, I think there's, there's a huge potential to rethink the classical notion of architecture itself. And you're, you're mentioning skins, of course. We can, we can now imagine skins that are only, only a few millimeters thick, which have better properties than uh, a 30 centimeter brick wall or concrete wall could ever have, and uh, both in terms of insulation and in terms of um, additive or additional properties like lighting or producing energy or, or maybe even moving and changing and, and maybe even structurally. I mean, if we work with the right um, complex carbon fiber reinforced fabrics or whatever, they can also have structural properties, maybe not up to a hundred or a thousand meters, whatever, but um, I think you can still negotiate it. Of course, it doesn't mean that we replace all the traditional technologies, but I think it adds another layer to it, um, which which is definitely important to explore. Okay, maybe last last one, because because you have always this, or you are fascinated in the maker movement, or that your students fabricate the material themselves, and so hmm. is this also how you envision in architecture that 
people would build their own buildings or so, or is this just like a means of being able to make these experiments now in the academia? I'm, I mean, I'm not, this is, it's, it's more literacy. It's, it, I don't think that everybody's going to make their smart materials at home now. The same as not everybody's going to make their own chairs at home and not everybody's going to build their own buildings. But I think it's a liberation. It's a possibility and it's, it's some sort of intellectual change. So if you know how this thing works, then you can start communicating with somebody, a material scientist, for example, who knows really what these things are. But if I, if I as a designer, go to a material scientist and tell him, okay, I want to have this wonder material that can be 20 meters long, it can light, it can change its shape, it can fly, whatever, then they're going to laugh at me. But if I tell them, okay, I've, I've done this before, I've experimented with some of the materials, I know that hypothetically, I, I think I could put them together even, it wouldn't work for very long, it wouldn't last very long, but it could work, then we can communicate on a different level. And I think that's important for us as architects and as designers, that we actually reach levels in order to communicate with other disciplines and that we start collaborating more instead of this classical notion of the architect or and, and also the designer that, that you design something and then you give it away to somebody else who actually makes it. And I think that's one of the also of the liberating aspects in architecture that we are not anymore only the ones who design, but we are also the ones that can make. And maybe we are not the best in making, maybe there's others who can make it better, but because we have some sort of knowledge, we can do it together with them. And no, I don't think everybody will build their own houses. Well, people do already, but <laughs> not the best ones. <laughs> uh. Yeah. When you some of the students for um, you, you said that somehow they just go and produce the dark side of the future. And I'm just wondering if most of these students produce something like dark side and the material that is already there is dark and the next generation of students are looking at this dark side of the future. And if that's... I don't know, what, I think What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, I've been watching Black Mirror, I'm getting scared. Well, I've, I've had this discussion a few times. I think um, it's always much easier to envision something bad than something good. I think that's just in our human nature. That's one reason. Uh, another is that these materials, of course, if you self-make them, they have some sort of, I wouldn't call it darkness, but or organicity, something that is not clean and, and shiny and, and, and industrial. And I think that's something that plays in there as well. So if you see something that you can't really describe, then it maybe automatically becomes darker or more dystopian. Hmm? Not really. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and maybe it's also their fear of the future. I don't know. I, because, I, I mean, it, it's, it, it, the more you think about it, the more disturbing it gets, I think. But maybe this also relates to this idea of anti-capitalism. <laughs> because you have, uh, uh, traditionally, it's uh, dystopias and utopias are easier to communicate. Hmm. So they are mainstream, uh, very similar also. Hmm. And uh, all the things in between, like uh, uh, critical optimism, things that to a certain extent seem to be contradictions, mm. all rely on knowledge. Yeah. You know, because I want to be critical if you don't know about making. You mm. know, uh, I have no clue. And uh, I think to to have this uh, sort of or to to propagate this broader understanding of things and also reach and also. Uh, uh, self-understanding, not only of architects in general, can help filling these gaps in between. Mm. You know, because if your own choice is to be against or for something, in con without any, you know, considerations, then we don't go very far in design, but in general too. Mm. No, and also the line in between dystopia and utopia is a very thin one. So, I think I don't know who who this quote is from, but you're. Utopia is my dystopia. I don't know who said that, but um, yeah. Well, I might have missed it, but um, coming, you seem to come from this maker like background or maker com community. And what made you choose uh, all this video as a media hmm. for the students to work with? Like uh, again, several reasons, I think, especially. I wouldn't call myself a maker. I'm just interested in, in, in these kind of things. Yeah, but anyhow, it doesn't matter. 
Um, uh, the, the reason for the videos was um, many reasons. For First of all, if you have a dynamic material, you can only show its, its dynamics through uh, a, a, a time, basically. And for time, you need to have more than just a static image. You need to have m more images. Um, that's one thing. Also, the other thing is that videos always communicate um, something much better in a shorter span than if you actually show it just in pictures and plans and sections. And uh, the last reason, um, especially for the last videos, was um, uh, because I wanted to focus on the atmosphere of those spaces. Like really try to, m and we, we, all, we even had a group that made a, a virtual reality installation. That was really cool because you could put on these goggles and you would wander around in their, in their space. So I, I think it's really interesting on in, in how you can actually communicate those spaces, those dreams, those images um, with some additional depth. And video, I think, and sound, and, and I mean a, a video clip, how we did it here, it's much more than just the images, right? You have to, the editing is really important, the sound is really important, the music, if you add some, is really important. Um, so I really like that multi-layered um, approach. Okay, yeah? Big thank you. Thank you.